uh, I will be letting more people in. I'm very happy to be here with so many people and especially with Pablo Romero Fresco, who's uh, our guest speaker. And, uh, and it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to have him. We've known each other for quite some time. So uh, we're also friends, not just uh, colleagues. And um, I, well, thank you, Pablo, for saying yes to us. No, no problem at all. It's a pleasure. So I will just uh, briefly introduce Pablo uh, Romero Fresco, who is very young, but also um, it, he has a brilliant career already. So I'll try to, to summarize uh, some of the things he's done and he's doing. Um, he's Ramon y Cajal researcher at the University of Vigo, Universita de, de Vigo in Spain, and also honorary professor of translation and filmmaking at the University of Roehampton in London. Um, he is the author of many articles and also two important books, Subtitling Through Speech Recognition Respeaking for Routledge and Accessible Filmmaking, Integrating Translation and Accessibility into the Filmmaking Process, again published by, by Routledge. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of Audiovisual Translation, JAT, and he is the leader of the International Research Center, GALMA, Galician Observatory for Media Access, for which he is currently coordinating several international projects on media accessibility and accessible filmmaking too. Pablo is also a filmmaker. His first documentary, Joining the Dots, was screened during the 69th Venice Film Festival. And it was also used by Netflix as well as film schools around Europe to raise awareness about audio description. Um, his next feature length documentary will screen next year. And this is a surprise also for me, I didn't know this. So Pablo, um, thank you very much for, for being with us. Um, when I was asked to um, find a special guest, a special speaker for this week, which is dedicated to inclusion, first person that came to my mind was you because of what you've been doing so far, because of you uh, uh, joining um, an interest in filmmaking with an interest in making films accessible. Uh, so I'll just leave it to you. And um, today's topic is creative media access, which is Pablo's latest uh, activity and you know latest publications that are coming up soon. That's enough. I will just be uh, leaving the floor to Pablo and then we will have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Hmm? Oh. Uh, you should be able to unmute now. yourself. Oh, oh, now, yes, yes. It was just not possible before, but it's okay now. Thank you very much, Elena, for your introduction, especially for your invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Quite daunting because I don't think I've ever done uh, Zoom with so many people, but I'm sure it'll be fine. But thank you very much, Elena. It's a pleasure to have you as a colleague and, and a friend. So I'm going to... Um, compare, uh, sorry, share this screen so that we can get started with um, a little presentation. Hopefully sharing it now. Is that, can you see yes. it? Yeah, cool. Um, let me just make sure that I'm sharing the audio as well. Just a second. Because I, I want to make sure that when I play the videos. Okay, let's see. Oh, there we go. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, as Elena mentioned, the plan for today is to talk about creative media accessibility. Um, I'll try and keep the chat open, but Elena, if there's any question, I'm happy to take it or any comments, I'm happy to take it. So, um, in order to talk about this creative approach to media access, which is ongoing and, and quite significant these days. Um, I think it's important first to start from what accessible filmmaking is, which you mentioned, Elena, um, and that would be can we consider translation and or accessibility as a film or even well, mostly audiovisual products are being produced instead of at the end, that's normally done, yeah? So can we consider it throughout the making of the film um, and in collaboration with the creative team? This is what we've been doing for the past, say, seven to eight years working on this model, yeah? Um, and we work on, on providing access to everyone uh if we can we'll talk about it today as well but that means 
linguistic access, sensory access, etc. Let's talk about also today about the issues that this is bringing about these days, the problems that this is bringing about. But because there's this collaboration with the creative teams, because we're working with filmmakers, for example, which is very exciting, then this is leading to creative approaches to media access. That is, filmmakers who say, you know, why don't we test something beyond the guidelines? You know, why don't we go further? Um, and it's not always easy because we don't have enough literature practi practice, we don't have enough experience about it. So it's becoming a bit of an issue, even for me, sometimes to find creative audio describers uh, or creative subtitlers, you know, people who go um, beyond, like I said, beyond guidelines and conventions. Uh, we know that there are articles out there, um, and I'm mentioning some here. Um, and of course, there's the, the, the there's, there's perhaps more work being done at opera and in the theater, which Elena knows very well and has done, but still there's not enough, you know, and, and even if yeah, this was, a, I think a month ago, if you Googled creative media accessibility, you didn't get a, a single hit. Um, so what is going on with that? You know, I wondered why we don't have more of this, more of a creative approach to media accessibility. Um, so, so one of the questions that I wanted to ask today is why hasn't it been tackled today? Um, more till now. Um, and I have a bit of an answer that I've worked on um, till now and another answer that I was thinking of today that I want to share with you. So one is, well, first, perhaps one is the fact that we have been moving from what was an expert-led type of approach, as in we'll, we have guidelines that are set by experts, to a more scientific cognitive turn. That means, okay, let's do research, experimental research with the users. I'm sure as, as students of Elena's classes, you will have heard about reception studies. Elena has written a book with Yves Gambier about it as well, where we, we, all of us actually, a lot of us, worked on experiments with the users and measuring their comprehension, their preferences, you know. And in my view, this is a democratization of the guidelines because we involve the users in those guidelines. At least, you know, when we test 100 users' views or comprehension on something, well, you know, those guidelines will involve a little bit of that of those users' views, right? So in a way, they're democratized. They're not, they're no longer based on the views by the expert, which is a good thing. Um, so we are focusing on the majority, on a quantitative approach, you know, which by the way, has led us to talk about media for all and the universal, you know, which all of which has been really useful as a horizon towards we, w w which we can go, you know, but, uh, or, and actually yet is when we're looking at eye tracking and again, we've been involved in eye tracking studies normally eye tracking tell, tells us where viewers are looking right so in the scene we would be focusing on the main aspect we're focusing on what most people are looking at um, but i think that we have tended to exclude people who were looking elsewhere who were a minority uh, in scientific terms they are called the outliers and in scientific studies um, they are different these data from, from outliers are different, uh, problematic and not valid because we have to rule them out. They're not part of a majority. And what we need is a majority view so that it is significant, a statistically significant, which is the key. Can something be statistically significant? So the individual views are kind of ruled out or set aside, yeah? They're excluded. And this means that we have scientifically valid data, which is very, very good. But in my view, this has led to us focusing on guidelines that are very homogeneous for films that are not so homogeneous. Um, we are building ramps so that people can access films, but we tend to build, I don't want to be too harsh because it's not the point, but we tend to build the same ramp for very different buildings. They're very different films, you know? Um, so we, when we apply media access, um, sometimes I think that this means that I teach my students as though they were technicians. You apply your guidelines, you know? These are the guidelines, these are the rules, apply them. And they like it and they do it correctly and they provide access. But it's a little bit like apply what's out there. Um, and sometimes it's not particularly conducive to a creative treatment. 
because creative treatments of films by definition have to individualize the films they have to think of the films as as different right but not but but that doesn't always happen with guidelines so um, this could be this could be one of the reasons right the fact that by providing us with solid scientifically valid guidelines we have maybe left aside some of the most experimental creative approaches yeah hope that makes sense but i'm gonna add another question another answer that i was uh, working on today which was um so a lot of us are now conflating audiovisual translation and media accessibility which one is which you know um audiovisual translation includes subtitling and dubbing but then again media accessibility includes subtitling and people like Gian Maria Greco are giving us uh, maps like this one where we say well you know audiovisual translation here is involved in translation studies media access is in accessibility studies but there's an overlap between them right so some elements are common and some elements are not fine but many of them are really common especially if we consider accessibility for all right uh, but he adds something that I thought it was very interesting which is Audiovisual translation and media access look at the world through different lenses. Now, this is very, very important because what is the lens through which we look at creativity in audiovisual translation? Um, if I think of audiovisual translation and I think of a presentation, for example, that Fede Chaume gave in Italy not long ago about creative audiovisual translation, they mostly talk about creative audiovisual translation in distribution, that is, not in collaboration with the filmmakers, often made by fans, right? And this is true, it's happening. For example, you get subtitles with the, instead of footnotes, a top or a head note where they explain something. This is a fan that adds creativity to uh, provide an explanation that was not there. Or sometimes you even get image translation, like for example, in uh, Inside Out, where the original film had a scene of a hockey team, yeah, a hockey, a hockey game, which the girl in this animated film was thinking of. And then to make this more relevant in other countries, they replaced it by this, by a soccer um, scene, you know? So you get a shot replaced by another shot to, to be able to globalize the film and sell it to countries where hockey is not big. That's another way of translating, right? And it's creative, very creative. Um, but you know, all these things that are happening in audiovisual translation, if you look at it from the point of view of translation, uh, we can analyze them as Chaume was saying, they are traveling texts, they are stories that travel across media, they are adaptations, yeah? But for me, they're seen as a bonus. They're seen as an, you know how they say in English, an icing on the cake. We have what we need, let's get a little bit more, you know? Let's, um, you know, it's welcome, but it's not expected and it's not demanded, you know? And certainly there's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of we need to do this to make it work. Otherwise it doesn't work. There's no that sense. And because there's no urgency, well, it's happening, but only here and there. Now, this is very different from creativity in media access. Creativity in media access, if we draw on disability studies, if we draw on creep theory, if we draw on queer theory, this is all about saying, well, some audiences are being left behind because the guidelines provide for them, yes, but they are not having a multi-sensory experience. Um, their experience is a second-rate experience because, and I'll give plenty of examples, but because we describe the sounds, you know, in words, as you know, in the subtitles, right? But they don't feel it. Can we make them feel those sounds, you know? Otherwise they just get explanations. Uh, we describe the images, but how much do they feel? How uh, much of an embodied, fully bodied knowledge experience are they getting? And when this doesn't happen, then this becomes an urgent matter because it, it's, it's a matter of social equity, you know? They don't get what they need to get to have a full experience. So it's not the same sense of urgency. Um, and I remember that a few years ago, I wrote this paragraph in, in an article, which now I'm thinking, should I have written this or not? Which was, um, why don't we widen media access to include everyone? Fine. Why? Because foreign viewers benefit from the impact that media access has through legislation and human rights debates. And media access, that is 
just to very, very simplistically say blind and deaf people, for example, can benefit from the fact that people who consume, who use translations are huge numbers. So there's not a minority. So everyone is a win-win. But because we have brought together this, then now I think that creativity in media access is being stopped or stalled or slowed down because in translation, there's no urgency for this. It's interesting and it's great. And we debate about the terminology and everything, but it's not a it's not a crucial matter yet. Um, and I think for the artists with whom I've been working lately, being creative with media access, it's a matter of identity, of justice, and it's urgent, it's vital. So, you know, I think that we may have to rethink a little bit what we are, where we're coming from anyway. Um, so these are some of the reasons why maybe we haven't made more progress till now in terms of being creative in media access. Of course, there's a question of what is creativity? Where is creative media access? Well, we have to work more on that, but here's a, a, a kind of a working definition, you know? Those practices that not only attempt to provide access for the users of a film or a play, but they seem to become an artistic contribution to it, yeah? And they often seek to enhance the experience of the users in a creative or imaginative way. I know that there are lots of issues with this because is media access not creative per se? Yes, I understand. We can present it as a as a spectrum from less to more creative. I'm sure there are loads of ways we can do this, but they shouldn't stop us from working on this, you know? Um, so yes, we have the issue, but shouldn't stop us from working on, on these creative practices which are happening in different places. And now we're beginning to try to trace them a little bit. I'm not going to get into this much more because I leave you this access, this uh, a video and an article there. But a lot of people and and some of, for example, Kate Dangerfield talks about a create a, an alternative media access. That is, we're talking about a media access that moves away from the guidelines as they are now. They go beyond comprehension. So it's not only about can I make the viewer understand, for example, uh, describe the images that I see but he cannot see or the sounds that I can hear, but they cannot hear, or, you know, it's not just that. It's about engaging the viewers. And engaging means engaging in different ways, multi-sensory engagement. Um, you know, there's there's touch, there's sound, there's image, and see how, how far you can get with that. So it's about engagement, not only about comprehension, I would say. Um, a lot of people have been claiming, working on this for, for quite some time now. And it is what these filmmakers say as well. It's um, transcending basic considerations of comprehension. I mean, they have used this model to become an extension of a creative approach of the film. This is what I think is creative media access. You know, it's an extension of the creative approach that the filmmakers take to the film. Today, I'd like to make a difference between creative media access and artistic media access, just because sometimes at the very extreme, at the very creative extreme of creative media access, we can have this form of artistic media access, which is interesting because it's not just that it's extending the, the approach of the film, it's actually using media access as the artistic element. Uh, but, you know, we'll talk about it as well. So, this is what it is. And now, how is it being developed, you know, in practice, research, especially practice? Um, so uh, there's two different ways. You could do it in collaboration with a creative team or not. I'm interested in, in the collaboration with the creative team. But as I said before, a lot of people are working on creative approaches to media access and translation, not in collaboration with a creative team. That is happening once the film is finished and uh, the filmmakers are not aware of this. And, and you get Jorge Diaz Cintas, for example, in subtitling different types of cyber subtitles or internet subtitles and there's loads of creativity there involved in users sometimes professionals a lot of people working on this as well that's that's not the main concern here for me um because it's that's a tricky one that's a, that's a tricky one because uh, there's oh, there's been a great deal of creativity throughout and it's quite difficult and it's different i'm concerned with a yes here with the in collaboration with the creative team and to be honest, especially with media access because of, of the importance of it. Um, so if we go to this here, I used to talk about invisible and, invi and visible, but 
I stand corrected by some people who believe that invisible is not the right word. In inconspicuous, meaning discreet. Conspicuous, meaning more uh, aiming to attract attention. That's where I would put the two extremes. Are we looking for a creative media access that seeks to become discreet and blend in the film? Or are we looking for a media access that seeks to become a protagonist? That is, subtitles that draw our attention and become a protagonist? Or creative subtitles, for example, that use the creativity to just merge into the film, you know? And anything in between, yeah? Okay, so we have plenty of examples here and I'll show you more um, of filmmakers who have been in touch with us to become a little bit more creative in, in the use of media access. We have this film, a Galician film, where we prepared, for example, uh, for the subtitles that they wanted. We prepared a portfolio. So what we did was, okay, let's just prepare a portfolio for the filmmaker with the typographic identity of the film. That is the visual identity of the fonts on screen, yeah, of the subtitles. Do we want, for example, we gave them, um, here it says types of fonts, colors, shadows, positions, uh, visual effects. And we give him this portfolio saying, these are the options, now you choose, right? So, you know, do you want your position to be there, sorry, your font to be this one, or slightly more square, or you wanted um, thinner, and, and all these fonts, they have, there's something, there's something called font psychology, which is all about what the font tells you, um, the beyond the meaning of the words, right? So what does it convey? Does the font convey a sense of seriousness, a sense of playfulness, a sense of, you know, all these things have been studied. Um, so so what do they want? Once you tell the filmmakers, well, you know what? There's not just one font that you can use, you can use any, and now you have to make more, more choices, right? Um, what else do we have? We have positions as well. I mean, are we looking at um, positioning the subtitles here under the speaker? Are we looking at position subtitle on top by the face as they speak or maybe here? Why? Because we have more space. The speaking and the looking space is on the right hand side of the screen as I look at it. So is that where the eyesight is going and where I want my subtitle or not? Well, I may have an opinion. Now my opinion comes second to the opinion of a filmmaker, right? So we discuss with them. And you know the beautiful thing about it, I don't know if I have anything else here about on, I don't think so, no. The beautiful thing about this is that the filmmaker, because he knew about this, he made time and space in his post-production agenda to work with us. So he secured two and a half weeks so that we could discuss over a couple of days the approach, and then he got back to us and he said, you know what? This has been one of the most rewarding experiences that I've had because I never thought that I could include this as part of a post-production decision. So it's it was really rewarding. And by the way, he just wanted to the subtitles to blend in the film. He chose quite creative elements, but to be discreet and blend in. So positions on the side, um, background colors that match with the main background color of the scene and other elements. But it was very, very rewarding to work with him. Um, a little bit more, well, I would say still quite un incon inconspicuous, would be what filmmaker Miguel Angel Font did, did for his short film Tiempo de Blues. He wanted to make the film accessible to blind people, partially sighted blind people through audio description. And what he did was um, include some elements that were going to be heard by everyone, but only understood by some. So what he did was, I have a the bad guy in the film, this guy behind the counter, serving this drink to this girl. Um, and I don't want to be saying all the time, I don't want to be saying, and he approaches the bar and blah, 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 right? So in order not to include that description that he thought was a bit cold and objective and, and it draws us away from the film, he gave him a little um, key ring that he was wearing. So that every time he approaches, you can hear the key ring and you don't have to describe that he's approaching. So what you're doing here is you're playing to the abilities of the users. The users may not be able to see what's going on, but they're certainly able to hear what's going on if they're hearing all the description. And it's the key ring that tells them that this person is coming in without the need for a description. 
and that key ring stays there for everyone because it doesn't bother us as sighted viewers. So it's a diegetic element to facilitate the engagement um, of the blind and partially sighted viewers with the film without having to go through their comprehension. You don't have to explain that this person is coming. Yeah, that's what I meant before about engaging the senses. Um, and in this case, the hearing um, for those who can see, but uh, those who can hear, but not see. Mm, more. Um, well, you have creative subtitles. You know, people normally ask about this and here we have some. So I'm gonna show you an example of subtitles that in this case, I'm placing them towards the conspicuous, that is the not discreet, the attention grabbing kind of um, pole because, well, you can see it here now. Hopefully, let's see. Uh, the British people have spoken. Uh, no, they haven't. Elena, can you see in here? Constitutional amendments are or should be hard. No, um, in America, we don't see a video, we just see an image. Just a second. Uh, Hopefully now. In yes. both houses of Congress. It's easy to see why the bar is set so high. Unlike ordinary lawmaking, constitutional changes are for keeps. Voters are fickle, opinions change. We have no right to condemn future generations to abide irrevocably by the transient whims of the present. If ever a decision needed at least a two-thirds majority, it was Brexit. Brexit is permanent. It has huge ramifications, complex consequences. The costs and benefits, whatever they may be, and you need a PhD in economics to predict them, will resonate down the decades. So did Kaking expert advice? No, he didn't. With Florence Future. I think you get the idea um, of basically, I'm just going to go back to the presentation, but you get the idea of something that hopefully you can see the presentation now. Yeah, of, of subtitles that take complete protagonism, uh, center stage, in the spotlight, and they contribute with further meaning, yeah, creatively and iman imaginatively. So that's part of, of the conspicuous approach to, in this case, uh, creative media access, creative subtitles. Um, some people, like Godard, for example, go a little bit further, and they just use creativity to disrupt. So in a film like Film Socialism, what he does is he used what he calls Navajo subtitles, which are basically, well, if he says the Indians in Western American films were made to speak very simplistically in one, two word sentences, he says, now I'm going to give to pay that back and I'm going to subtitle my French spoken, French speaking film with just a few words. So you hear French, but you hear, you can only read a couple of words every time. Like, for example, here, you, you read no choice. And this person has said a full sentence in French. So you're only given a few words here and there as your only way into the dialogue of the film because he's playing with you, he's disrupting. He's telling you, well, uh, you know, maybe a subtitle does not have to be a faithful account of a dialogue, you know? Maybe it doesn't have to be, I don't know, faithful. Maybe it doesn't have to be an account at all, you know? So what if we disrupt everything uh, and what do we do with it? Um, and once we take this and we play with it, we realize that Godard was playing, but he was talking about translation. So he was playing. Remember in translation, there's no that sense of urgency. But now that we know that some um, mostly deaf blind artists are playing with media access, there is no longer a game for them, you know, like it was for Godard. For them, it's more of a point to be made as to the exclusion um, that they're living through, that they're going through because of the way the world has been set up. So this is the difference that I meant, you know, it's not only a game, which is very useful to make a, a great deal of points, it's something else. And some of the artists that I've been working on and with um, are doing that. And one of them is Lisa Silvestre. She's a deaf um, artist in America and she used to 
and she's she's um, profoundly deaf and she used to have to attend lots of lessons at school where there were films being shown to her with no captions. She says out of boredom, but also out of my desire to fit in and hide the fact that I didn't know what was going on. I was documented what I could understand. So it looked like she was taking notes, but she was actually trying to scribble down what she could understand from the non caption films that she was being shown. And this is what she does in here, caption series, where she put together some scenes from the TV and she transforms those kind of notes into captions. So she talks to us through the captions that she adds to scenes that had no captions. Yeah, it's her voice. Um, think about it normally when we subtitle for, for you know, deaf, hard of hearing people, we add captions that sometimes is our voice talking to them, telling them, this is the sound that you cannot hear, right? A door opens or whatever. So that's us talking to them. In this case, it's her talking to us. That's how she uses captions. For example, um, she says, as she sees this shot in a scene from an animation movie, that happened first. She must live there. She's making assumptions as to what's happening. The sky still doesn't let me know what time of the day it is. And, and by reading this, we learn how a deaf person tries to get meaning from the visuals, which are the key thing, not the sounds, the visuals, right? Um, or she wonders what's going on in the scene because she doesn't know. Or she gets help from a text and she says, wow, suddenly I get text and everything makes sense. Or we are looking at the main point of the scene where the protagonist is speaking and the partner is looking for information. And as hearing viewers, we would probably be missing what's going on in the background. Because remember what we said about eye tracking? Everything is here. So who's looking there? That's Lisa looking there. Because she has no sound and she explores the visuals. And she realizes that the key part of the scene is actually that the car that these guys want to drive and have parked is going to be towed away. And she says in the background, something's happening. Or look at here. She says in the scene, I just realized that none of these people who are in a train are swaying with the movement of the train. And she says, I, sh I think IMDB should hire hard of hearing people to catch those trivia bloopers. What she's saying is, you know, sometimes because you're hard of hearing or deaf and all you have is the visuals, you can really, really notice the visuals. You can really notice much more than other people who don't have to pay so much attention. But look at this as well. I'm, I'm very fascinated with the idea of her using her captions to describe images. She smiles knowingly. Her face is so pale that it glows. Their homes have similar colors, dark grays and blues and hunter greens, with light sources breaking up the dark shapes. We see her through her furniture, which feels intimate. Now, for me, this is audio description. This is content that if you were to convey it through audio would be a very nice and warm, actually, audio description, very individual audio description. Um, and, and it makes you wonder, I mean, that obviously because she relies on the visuals, wouldn't she be great to actually provide some content that then is provided as audio description for blind and partially sighted people? And can we do the opposite? Um, sometimes she just gives you personal accounts um, or for example, he, well, comments, social comments, but she tells you it's impossible to read cartoon leap, lips. Or it occurs to me that people have entire relationships through their phone. I haven't been able to hear well enough to talk on once since high school. I feel sometimes entirely cut off from pop culture. And I'm wondering how to make connections with when I don't share the same content. This is key. It's not the same content. In translation, it's almost the same content. We can add creativity or not. Here, it's a matter of urgency, as I said before, because the content becomes different. It's not the same content we are sharing unless there's full access, yeah? Um, social situations, he says in another scene, in another caption, often feel like nightmares. I grope along the edges of conversation. I smile too much. I waste too much time pretending. And she gives an account about, I'm not going to read all this, but she's an account about her son. And she says, her son is two years old. Well, I'm going to read that. Why not? I'm worried about being able to hear and understand my child. Children's voices are very hard for me to understand. They don't articulate. They're high and soft. But I understand my son better than most people because 
he's not yet, yet three years old. And I've memorized all the shapes of what he has to learn, or he's learned to say. He learns new words just fast enough for me to learn those shapes too. I am fluent in the language of my son, but I have no idea what's going on in this film, she says, and the strain of trying to understand makes me yearn for another drink. This is what you start to see when you're excluded from the design of the world. This is important for me because that's it. Are we designing films for exclusion or for inclusion? You know, um, And it makes you really wonder. And for me, what we're seeing here in those captions, it's a window into this woman's world. You know, It's individual. It's not generalizable. It may not be statistically significant, but it's equally valuable, I think. And if we do have time, yes, I think we do. I'm going to show you one more example of um, a fantastic artist called, called Kristin Sum Kim. She is a celebrity. She, she did uh, the national anthem in the US at the Super Bowl with la sign language. But she works a lot on what I call artistic, I think, create, uh, media access, which is, which is media access as a generative element from an artistic point of view. Uh, and she just gives us this little idea about what happens if she was the one as a profoundly deaf sign language user to provide her own captions. Here it is. No sound, by the way, of course. Um, let me just see if I can come share the right screen. Hopefully you can see it now, Elena. Thank you. No sound, as I said, for now. I think this needs to be understood as not, okay, let's caption like this, because, you know, it will be not accessible for a lot of people. And I think we just need to see it, you know, with a pinch of salt saying, okay, so what is it that she's trying to tell us as well, right? Um, what can we learn from this? And from the captions that quite fancifully, um, creatively, uh, playfully, she's going to add now. Just going to show some of them. Oh, okay.
Now, what I mean by this is, you know, what is she giving us here? She's just telling us, okay, I want a fuller experience, fine. Um, but she wants to be poetic. She wants to go beyond the guidelines. She wants to, um, to not go through simple comprehension. And what she ends up giving us is, after those, the sound of words, when she says the sound of, I don't know, hurt feelings coming over, no, but at the beginning, when she says, for example, they begin like the first, okay, let's see if I can, uh, the sound of sun entering the bedroom. What is that? You know, that's certainly not the description of sound, it's a description of images, um, but also of feelings. So my question to you is, in the same way that as a deaf person, a deaf artist, Lisa was describing images in a way that was poetic and could do audio description. Um, can we have some of the content that these artists are giving us here being used as access for both blind and deaf people? Because we're we're meeting somewhere in between. You know, we are we are using accessibility in an artistic manner as a meeting place of experiences of people who may not have access to sound or to images. But maybe the poetic touch is this crossroads where sometimes we have the same content being valid somehow to provide an experience for both. It's, it's just a question that I leave out there, you know, um, and I'm working with Lisa Silvestri on, on creating something like that. But, but it's just one of the places where an artistic approach to media access can lead us, you know, to uh, maybe in a way um, blurring the boundaries between experiences and going, like, like we said, going beyond beyond guidelines. I'm just going to finish now um, so that we have enough time by just drawing some conclusions really about what we can learn from this uh, in terms of research, training, practice. So for research, I, what do we do here? What do we say here? Well, you know, why don't we study these issues more qualitatively? Why don't we interview people? Why don't we um, try to learn maybe a lot about a few people in a way that is not significant, you know, statistically significant, but it, it's still meaningful, you know? Um, why don't we focus on those individuals or outliers who look differently? Because, you know, Lisa's example, for example, for me, it's valid from the point of view of teaching and research as, as a personal experience. Statistically, insignificant, but socially, I think it's very important. Um, and so we don't need masses of people. We just need meaningful data from a few. Um, and as Brown says, you know, this tells, tells us more about the differences between people, you know, because it's here in the idiosyncrasy, in the differences where we can learn as well, you know. So it's not just about the homogeneous groups, majority for all type of approach, which is very useful, but why don't we complement it with the individuals, the outliers, the excluded, the differences. He says, to understand humans and indeed cinema, the cinema that I produce and watch, we need to account for these differences because our differences are every bit as important as the humanity that we all otherwise share. I, I do firmly believe in this as well. Um, training, well, why don't we complement our guideline-based training with these approaches? Um, it's good because, you know, we are automating everything we know Google Translate, speech recognition, we know everything is advancing very quickly, but in this little corner of creative media access, creative translation, I just can't see machines uh, being as effective at the moment, you know. This is a nice, sh uh, safe shelter for us to, to work on. Um, and for, for students to add a very rewarding artistic side or string to their bows. Um, professionally speaking, well, a lot of people say, but is this, is this going to be important? Sorry. A lot of people ask if this is going to be mainstream. I, I don't know if it's going to be mainstream. I don't think. And I don't think that's even the point, said respectfully, because in a way, it's meant to react to mainstream views, and that's the way it's, it's working, no? Um, but the more we work on it, the more likely it is that more and more filmmakers will, will adopt this approach. And the more we work with artists collaboratively in an accessible filmmaking manner, the more likely they are, or we are, to adopt these approaches because they are creative people.
Um, and like I said, you know, let's not lose the sense of urgency. It's not just a bonus. It's not just a luxury that we can maybe sometimes have. For a lot of people, this is necessary. Otherwise, they will not have the experience that they're supposed to get. Um, this is something that we maybe think of. So this is not just a new approach to media access. I think it's a new approach to filmmaking in general, to art making in general, yeah? And it's one that we as translators and media access experts, we can definitely be part of um, because it's collaborative and it can help us learn a lot about film, but also about individuals um, that we often talk about, but we don't often understand all the time, you know? Um, and there's two more things that I suggest from a scholarship point of view. I think that maybe we should start working on identifying ourselves, on saying, you know, I am saying this as a white middle-class hearing and sighted person, you know? And this is my perspective. Um, because otherwise we kind of hide uh, and we don't show this when we're writing articles, for example, we don't use the, third, the first person, and, but we often talk on behalf of or about other people, you know, who are exposed, but we don't expose ourselves. And I can only speak from the point of view of somebody who hears and sees. And those are my limitations, the limitations of my views as well. So I think it may be important that we start thinking of, of this as well, when we write, when we talk, um, because it is, it is the only perspective from which we can talk and it informs what we say as well. Um, and one more thing, which is more and more people are writing articles about this in a format that is called web text, which is with embedded videos, embedded um, audiovisual, with a format that adapts to the content. And maybe we should do that as well, because otherwise, um, we are trying to show something and then we end up explaining photographs and pictures. Whereas maybe we should use a more audiovisual format to explain the audiovisual kind of almost revolution that we're talking about. That's it. I always go on for too long, um, Elena. But uh, thank you very much, everyone. And should you have any questions, which I hope so, I'll be more than happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. I think we we can imagine that all our uh, you know participants here are clapping hands, but um, Zoom doesn't allow for this. No, it so doesn't. That's just well, we can describe it. So, um, well, I think it was great and very fascinating and very stimulating. And I would have like twenty questions myself, but I think it would be great to have questions. Well, I can see people clapping hands, uh, you know. Uh, Thank but, you. Um, if anyone has any question, uh, it would be great to take questions. And you can either raise your hand or, you know, use the chat or uh, uh, turn on your microphone, whatever. Who wants to break the ice? Um, so, do you think this is Francesca? Uh, do you think the creativity, <coughs> sorry, of amateur subtitles will play a role in media exhibitions in the future? Yeah, yeah, it has to, doesn't it? Um, I think even though it comes from a different perspective and from different needs and from different situations, it's a massive, massive inspiration, massive imp inspiration. Um, where the people I'm working on, uh, the people I'm working with, like some PhD students who are working on creative subtitling, they really have to be delving into everything to do with amateur subtitles because they are so free. They are free from the shackles of media, of sorry, of guidelines. So, you know, they can come up with anything. Um, they just do it not in collaboration with filmmakers. So they rely on their own creativity, but still equally creative. Um, so, and in a way they are freer because when we work with filmmakers, we don't have complete freedom. Um, unlike in traditional translation, in accessible filmmaking, you have to say yes to the filmmaker very often, unless you can persuade them. But uh, creative, uh, sorry, amateur subtitlers are completely free to do whatever they want most of the time. So yes, they are um, bound to play a role in media access in the future. I, I think so, in creative media access. Thanks for the question. That's very interesting. Yes, someone called them also guerrilla subtitlers, which is- That's right. 
That's right. So that would be those subtitles which are use of titling as an act of resistance to power and and norms. So in that case, I would say that probably that type of creativity d does have a sense of urgency because, you know, it is not just a game. It's it's um, to do with even justice as well. So that's quite interesting because it does link it to some of what we're saying here about creative media access. Thank you, Francesca. Who has more questions? Yeah, well, in the meantime, I have one. It's not really a question, but it's just, uh, um, you know, I found it extremely interesting that you commented on the video of the Chinese, Japanese lady yes. yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. saying that basically the poetic touch is the crossroads between what can be of I wonder, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And it's, um, um, I mean, her captions were descriptions, basically. So yeah. I was thinking while I was reading them, these are descriptions that could be useful in a creative way for blind people too. Yeah. And it would be great to, to, to have a blind person, you know, hear those captions yeah. and perhaps give a contribution, even in poetic yeah. terms. This is all very interesting. And, yeah, uh, yeah, because, because if you think about it, I mean, yes, the, she does add this, um, the sound off at the beginning, right? But if you take that away, then definitely. And um, it makes you wonder, you know, there's so many crossovers between creative writing in the same way that has been studied in literary translation, the the boundaries between literary translation and creative writing. Here, the same too, but also in the sense of, um, of yeah, of having, having this interaction between a blind and a deaf person and how they can contribute to one another. Because I think mm, if we start working on not guidelines, but creative media access practices where we don't focus only on give on compensating. So you cannot hear, therefore I tell you what you cannot hear. But we make the most of the fact that deaf people can see and the fact that blind people can hear, then then there are crossovers there, I think. And yeah. especially if you are a little bit more subjective, you no? Know? Uh, kind of which guidelines don't always allow you to do. But if you are more subjective and are unapologetically subjective. So you say, this is my view and I give it, you know? And I often wonder, you know, why don't you have all the descriptions that are provided by one character and that may not be reliable because that character is not reliable. So that character wants you to believe something and therefore describe something in a way that is not reliable, but I'm sorry, that's the way it is because that's their view, you know? So all those have been played with in terms of narration. So let's play with them in terms of of, of access as well because I don't know I just think that the ramp that we give with access is often very straightforward you know it's often very straightforward but I'm fascinated by some filmmakers who are saying you know what I want to leave and this is not a, obviously pun excluded my deaf and blind viewers viewers in the dark here I don't want to explain them this you know because I'm not explaining something else to sighted and hearing people I don't want to give everything you know let them work um, so that's interesting as well, you know, that idea of challenging all viewers, including um, viewers of the AD and SDH. So imagine how much there is to do, you know, yeah. a huge amount of... Chiara says, do you think creative subtitles will be used in streaming platforms like Netflix in the future? Um, yeah, okay. So I'm going to take the first question first, the second one uh, later. So first, uh, let me see if I can scroll up. Um, so Kiara, yeah, I think so. I've just I've just seen a, a wonderful little short film. I will send it to you, Elena, so you can share it about a a, a, a woman who, uh, in a world of subtitles where everyone speaks their own language, but everyone is subtitled, she is not subtitled, and she has to find a way to eat some pills so that she can have subtitles. Otherwise, she is subtitled with a line. Nobody can understand her in the world she's living in, um, and that is because those subtitles are need to be part of the film, they are burnt on the film, so they could be used uh, in platforms like Netflix. But till now, the problem that we've had is that creative subtitles cannot use those creative features in closed subtitles. Um, we need software that can allow us to do what we need to do with creative subtitles and allow, them, allow us to turn them on and off. And it's not happening yet. That's the problem. Most of the times they need to be burnt on the image. So platforms like Netflix, when we have sent them films like, for example, Notes on Blindness with creative subtitles, they have been reluctant because they have said, no, we cannot have um, 
different videos for the same film. We just have the one audio file, video file, and then different subtitles. But for creator subtitles right now, we need to have different video files. So we need to convince them um, that if they want the full experience for everyone, some films may need to have different video files, or we come up with a closed caption standard that allows us to use all those creative features. That's still to be done. 